Welcome to Learning with Philemon. In today's video, we will be looking at the spectroscopic technique Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, or NMR. NMR takes advantage of the fact that the nuclei of some atoms contain an odd number of protons or neutrons. When this is the case, the nuclei have a magnetic moment. In other words, they act like tiny magnets. In this video, we will focus on the hydrogen-1 nucleus. This is the most common isotope of hydrogen, with one proton and no neutrons in the nucleus. If there is no external magnetic field, the hydrogen nuclei have a random orientation. If an external magnetic field is present, the hydrogen nuclei can align with a magnetic field. This is the same effect as we see in a compass. A compass aligns with Earth's magnetic field. The north pole of the magnet in a compass points to Earth's north pole, which is the Earth's magnetic south pole. Going back to the hydrogen nuclei, there are two possible orientations. The hydrogen nuclei can align parallel in the same direction as the magnetic field, denoted by the symbol B. This is the lower energy configuration. They can also align against the external magnetic field. This is the higher energy configuration. The stronger the magnetic field, the bigger the energy gap between the two orientations. It turns out that light in the radio frequency range is the correct amount to cause a transition from the low to the high energy state. When a nucleus is in this orientation, it is said to be in resonance. Now we see why the technique is called nuclear magnetic resonance. A magnetic field is applied and then radio waves are used to make nuclei achieve resonance. So far we have only talked about nuclei, but let's consider the role of the electrons around the nuclei. As electrons spin and orbit the nucleus, they produce a magnetic field. This actually opposes the external applied magnetic field. The magnetic field of the electrons shields the nucleus from the applied external magnetic field. As a result, the gap between the two orientations, aligned or opposite, decreases. A smaller frequency is required to achieve resonance. Remember that the frequency of a wave is proportional to its energy. The less electrons around the nucleus, the larger the gap between the two orientations. This means a higher frequency is required to achieve resonance. This is the theory behind NMR. At IB and A level, it is much more important to be able to interpret spectra than explain the theory. Here we see the 1H NMR spectrum of 1-chloropropane. The x-axis of an NMR spectrum shows us the frequency of radio wave required to achieve resonance for a particular hydrogen nucleus. The x-axis is labeled chemical shift in ppm, parts per million. For more on the equation used to calculate chemical shift, please check the link in the description. The higher the ppm, the higher the frequency required and the lower the ppm, the lower frequency required to achieve resonance. For more on the relative nature of the scale, please watch the higher level video. In our NMR spectrum, we see three peaks. The peak at around 3.3 ppm corresponds to the hydrogens bonded to the carbon that is also bonded to a chlorine atom. Chlorine is a more electronegative element than carbon. This means that it pulls the shared electrons closer to itself. This has a knock-on effect as the slightly positively charged carbon now also pulls the electrons of the CH bonds closer to itself. The final result is that these two hydrogens have less electrons around them. Remember from the previous slide that electrons generate a magnetic field that shields nuclei from the external magnetic field. However, when hydrogen nuclei are near electronegative elements, they are de-shielded. 
they experience the external magnetic field more. The energy gap between the two orientations widens, and so a higher frequency is required. In NMR spectra, hydrogen nuclei near electronegative atoms, carbonyl groups, or carbon-carbon double bonds, will appear on the left of the spectrum at higher ppm. Notice that there are two hydrogen atoms, but only one peak. This is because both hydrogen nuclei require the same frequency to achieve resonance. These hydrogen nuclei are in what is referred to as the same chemical environment. The second highest peak corresponds to these hydrogens. The hydrogens are three bonds away from the chlorine atom, so the effect of electronegativity is felt less. These hydrogen nuclei are more shielded and require a lower frequency for resonance. Note that because there is a single bond between these two carbon atoms, there is free rotation about this bond. This means that neither hydrogen atom is closer to a chlorine atom. When we start introducing carbon-carbon double bonds, things get more complicated as free rotation is not possible. Finally, the lowest peak is for these hydrogens. They are far from the electronegative chlorine atom. They are the most shielded hydrogen nuclei in the compound. On the right-hand side of the spectrum, you will often find alkyl groups, such as CH3. In exams, you are given a data table showing the chemical shift of different functional groups, so you do not need to memorize specific numbers. Notice that there are three peaks in this spectrum, but more than three hydrogen atoms. This means that there are three distinct chemical environments. To determine the number of hydrogen atoms in each chemical environment, the area under each peak is determined. Note that if you zoom in, these peaks are actually curves, which is why we can use integration to calculate the area underneath. The value we are given when the program calculates is the integration trace, which is the relative area under the peaks. We get 2, 2, 3. This matches our analysis, as we have two hydrogens in chemical environment A, two in B, and three in C. NMR is the most useful technique in determining the structure of an unknown compound, as you can tell how many hydrogen atoms there are near which functional groups. Please watch the next video coming out on high resolution NMR and subsequent videos where we will use NMR to determine the structure of unknown compounds. To consolidate your learning, try the worksheet that can be found on my Patreon page. If you want to support my channel, check the donation link in the description. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel to get notifications for new videos. Stay curious.